It is my pleasure today to welcome you to the Allergy and Asthma Network's 2016 webinar series titled Advances in Allergy and Asthma. My name is Sally Schessler. I'm the Network's Director of Education. It is my pleasure to welcome you today to this month's offering in our year-long webinar series. We bring you nationally respected speakers each month to talk about issues that are important to you, so please plan to join us every month. For the first of our two October webinars, we are presenting Latex Allergy, Addressing Barriers to Emergency Anaphylaxis Care. I'd like to thank Sue Lockwood of the American Latex Allergy Association for working with us to arrange today's webinar. It is my pleasure to welcome our speaker, Dr. Wes Sublett. Dr. Sublett is a partner and co-director of clinical research at Family Allergy and Asthma based in Louisville, Kentucky, with 26 offices throughout Kentucky and Indiana. He is a graduate of St. Louis University and the University of Louisville School of Medicine. He's board certified in both pediatrics and allergy immunology. Dr. Sublett completed his internship and residency in pediatrics at the University of Louisville COSAR Children's Hospital. He completed his fellowship in allergy, asthma, and immunology at the University of Cincinnati. He has authored numerous scientific papers and several book chapters in the field of allergy and immunology. Currently, Dr. Sublett serves as the Vice Chair of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology Drug and Anaphylaxis Committee. Thank you so much for being here with us this evening, Dr. Sublett, and you, I, we're looking forward to the information you have to share with us. Well, thank you, Sally, and um, I'm glad that everybody's online. And I hope this becomes a uh, informative session, not only about latex allergy, but also about the use of epinephrine and anaphylaxis, which the two go hand in hand. So why are we here tonight? Well, we're here because we're going to talk about latex allergy, and latex comes from the natural, uh, is really about natural rubber latex, which comes from the sap of a rubber tree. These are mainly uh, found in Southeast Asia, uh, but they're also found uh, in Africa and now also South America. But most of our natural rubber latex actually is acquired in Southeast Asia. And what they do is they tap a tree and they collect the actual sap of the latex uh, of the natural rubber tree and um, after that, it goes into processing. And that's really when it differentiates itself into becoming um, allergenic or non-allergenic based on how it is processed. So where do we find natural rubber latex? A lot of the natural rubber latex that we find, at least in consumer products, are going to be found in balloons, condoms. It's not as much, uh, we don't see it as much anymore in some of the um, uh, previous, in the 80s, we used to see it a lot in uh, baby bottles, nipples, uh, rubber toys, but it can still be found in those consumer products. Most of the problems that we still have today are mainly because of latex gloves um, and the use of latex gloves. And so latex gloves are a dipped natural rubber product that really started off in the uh, when um, universal protections became prevalent, that's when we saw a rise in um, latex allergy. And so tonight, we're going to really talk about two different, uh, well, we're going to talk mainly about type 1 hypersensitivity or IgE-mediated reactions. But when we talk about latex reactions, we talk about two different types of reactions. The first is more of a contact dermatitis or what we call type 4 reactions. And those reactions, what you'll see is when a patient comes into, a person comes into contact with latex, they may develop a very itchy poison ivy like rash and that may last for days at a time. Some of those patients, we think, may go on to develop or may be at risk of developing a type 1 hypersensitivity, but some patients really just have type 4 hypersensitivity, and when they come into contact, physical contact, they develop an itchy rash that lasts for days. The type of hypersensitivity that we're all concerned about, and really is the life, potentially life-threatening type of allergic reaction, 
It's the type 1 hypersensitivity or IgE allergic mediated reaction. And so again, going back to what has caused this problem, we think that really in the 80s when the universal standard precautions became more prevalent, we saw a dramatic increase in latex glove use. And due to that, we saw not only an increase in manufacturing of latex gloves, but they also switched about that time from using a talcum powder to using a starch powder, which may have actually facilitated um, aerosolization of the latex allergen um, and caused it to potentially be more allergenic. And then because of there's an increased need in manufacture or increased need in latex gloves, they also began simplifying the process of manufacturing latex gloves and again utilizing that starch powder. And so the increased need for standard precautions, most likely because of the HIV epidemic, an increased manufacturing of latex gloves and use, and then overall using the starch powder is probably what we call high powder latex gloves really caused that problem of IgE sensitized individuals. So to date, there's 15 major, 15 allergenic been identified um, in latex. Some have been associated mainly with spina bifida, and that's hep B1 and 3. Um, a lot of work was done up in Wisconsin um, with uh, identifying that those individuals that have spina bifida that require multiple surgeries to correct their spinal cord issues were exposed to latex gloves during surgery, and um, they actually have an association with um, being allergic or sensitized to Hep B one and three. Compared to healthcare workers, which are exposed to the use of latex powder gloves, um, we don't see this. Pre the prevalence of latex allergy has probably gone down as we've switched to non latex allerg um, non-latex gloves through the use of nitrile gloves and vinyl gloves in the healthcare system. But healthcare workers were really in the 80s and 90s, and in some parts, dental workers today are still exposed to latex gloves, are potentially sensitized to FB5 and 6. There's other major proteins which were really um, are secondary allergens that may be related and those are going to be Hep B2, 4, 7, and 13. And then there's what we call cross-reactive or panallergens that may play a role that really um, makes sensitization very complex. And I won't go into that. So one thing that I'll briefly touch on, but I know that later in the month we'll have another latex webinar that will probably dive more into specifics of a lot of uh, topics related to latex allergy itself, and that's going to be the latex fruit syndrome, or where we see certain fruits that are cross-reactive with latex proteins. And that, that again, probably has to do with those cross-reactive uh, proteins that are very similar to those found in fruits, the Hep B6 and 7. And so those fruits are, um, are going to include avocado, latex, uh, they're also going to include kiwi um, and uh, chestnut. And so in those, in those particular uh, fruits, or in the case of chestnut, we see individuals that may have, uh, that have allergy to latex, but also develop um, systemic or anaphylactic-like symptoms when they ingest those specific fruits. However, not all individuals that have problems with latex um, have problems when they ingest those fruits. It's not always specific. And so some individuals that have uh, true latex allergy can ingest avocado, banana, and kiwi. Um, however, it's just something that, in, as an allergist, we always have to keep in mind. The other point is some people that are allergic to those specific latex fruit um, uh, cross-reactive fruits may not always be allergic to latex. So it's something that if you are having problems with those specific fruits 
or you're having problems with latex, you may want to talk to a board certified allergist to really get to the root of the problem, which is really what we're going to talk about a lot tonight. It's not only diagnosis, but about treatment. And so when we think about latex allergy, we're really going to think about um, really some very important steps. Um, one is identification and treatment of that latex allergy, and that's going to be best done with history and with a very specific history um, that involves not only exposures, but what the reaction was. That's going to really help us um, decide, do we need to do diagnostic testing? A lot of times, as an allergist, we hear stories that sound like it could be latex related, but may not, it may be something that's related at the time of the reaction. Um, and so that's where a proper history, history is probably the most important factor that we have in diagnosing latex allergy, but diagnostic testing is also very helpful. We'll get to that in just a minute. And then once we have a good history, we're going to talk about diagnostic testing. We're going to talk, if you do have latex allergy, how do you avoid latex? And then probably the most important thing, once we've developed that you, an individual does have latex allergy, we really need to decide, okay, how, what is the best treatment and action plan we have if you have anaphylaxis to latex? So again, going back to diagnosis, diagnosis of latex allergy, the most important thing that's been shown with research is a careful history of exposure and reaction history. Um, both skin testing and serological testing are important. These will help confirm the diagnosis, but what has been st found study after study is that if you have a history that is consistent with latex allergy, your skin testing and serological testing will help confirm it. Skin prick testing and serological testing both have, they're not as predictive without the history. You can have false positives without good history. And so history is probably the most important thing that we have when diagnosing latex allergy. Um, just because you have a skin prick positive to latex with skin testing or you're making IgE um, doesn't necessarily mean you have latex allergy. But if you have both of those and they help confirm what has been consistent with anaphylaxis during exposure, i.e., um, for example, if a healthcare worker is exposed to um, powdered latex gloves and develops hives and chest tightness, shortness of uh, breath and coughing and wheezing, and the healthcare worker goes on to have positive skin testing and also positive IgE via serological testing to latex, then that would confirm a true latex allergy. So once we've kind of decided that an individual has latex allergy, we really need to talk about avoidance. Because if you can avoid latex, then you reduce the, re the risk of having a severe allergic reaction. And so this has become a little bit easier in the healthcare system in the, in the sense that a lot of individuals, a lot of healthcare providers and facilities now are, are latex free. Um, caution still needs to be made um, and you still need to make your healthcare provider aware of, the, of an individual's latex allergy because there are rare circumstances where, for instance, um, stoppers in uh, medications can contain natural rubber latex. That's rare. Most of these are now synthetic, but it, it still can occur. Um, we know that some dentists continue to use um, latex gloves, and this may be for cost reduction strategies, um, but it may just be that they're um, it, they're not as aware of potential life-threatening allergic reactions to latex. Um, and so, again, uh, it's always best to have a healthcare provider or a dentist know that someone is latex allergic. Um, probably the biggest risk that we have now um, 
for a patient that has latex allergy is really going to be in the um, um, food industry. So the food industry, we still see a high percentage of people that are using latex gloves in the food industry. And that while it is getting better, there is still that risk. Um, and so identifying um, an individual that has latex allergy, when they go to a restaurant, it's always best to make those individuals aware that they are latex allergic to either the server or the shop. I would always recommend the shop because usually the, sh the shop is going to know what's going on in the kitchen, or at least they should. Um, and it's important to make that chef realize the importance of not exposing that individual to latex. Um, that's currently probably the biggest issue because no one, uh, food facilities do not have to um, make individuals aware that they're using latex gloves in the chicken and kitchen. Um, and that probably brings us to our next step. So once you've identified your allergy and made others aware, um, I'm always going to suggest that an individual that has any life-threatening allergic react or life-threatening allergy have a medical alert bracelet. You really need, as working with your um, board-certified allergist, develop a um, anaphylaxis action plan. Because as I tell my patients, it's not them, but I. That I don't trust. It's everybody else. You're more likely to get exposed by people that just don't understand how um, important it is for you to avoid your allergen, in this case, latex. And so that food facility worker that's working in the back making making sandwiches, making making your dinner, all they're thinking about is, okay, I have to wear these gloves to protect people from um, from infectious uh, bacteria, and so they, they're not really thinking, okay, I'm wearing this latex that can contaminate your food, and it's going to cause you to have anaphylaxis. So it's those that you can't see that I don't trust. And because I don't trust them, we need to develop a plan of what you're going to do when you develop anaphylaxis. And so that's why developing an anaphylaxis action plan with your healthcare provider is going to be extremely important. Um, and part of that action plan is using, if you've been exposed, what to look for, um, usually in the sense of an unknown exposure, you're going to look for what we call two-system involvement. And that's going to be skin, um, like hives, flushing, um, swelling, plus respiratory, and that could be coughing or wheezing, chest tightness, shortness of breath, or skin plus GI symptoms, vomiting and diarrhea, um, upset stomach, um, very, very bad cramp, abdominal cramping. Um, and it's usually going to be a combination of two systems. Again, skin plus respiratory, skin plus GI, or in rare cases, you know, GI plus respiratory. Um, and if there's ever a doubt and there's things that are just do, you don't feel are going going right and you think you've been exposed, um, epinephrine is very safe. And so using that epinephrine auto injector is, um, is never going to be, uh, it's never inappropriate if you think you're having a reaction. Part of having epinephrine, though, is making sure you carry it. So if you don't carry an epinephrine auto injector, it's not going to do you any good if you have anaphylaxis. Well, we now have some public access to auto injectors. The majority of the public has not, um, or the majority of public places and restaurants has not put in place mechanisms to have that auto injector on hand. So it's really up to the patient or up to the individual to carry the auto injector so that if they have a reaction, they can use it. So how do we treat anaphylaxis to latex? And this is like the underlying theme probably from this point forward, and that's always going to be epi first, epi fast. Um, if you think you're having a reaction, 
or you know you're having a reaction to latex. So in an individual that is latex allergic, they were exposed to latex, they know they were exposed, I would suggest that really all we need is one system involvement, and that could be urticaria, could be coughing or wheezing, could be vomiting and diarrhea. But if you know you've been exposed, you want to use that epinephrine fast and first to really get that reaction to end, potentially end or at least treat the reaction. If you're unsure you've been exposed, but it's probable, that's when you want to look for the two system involvement, skin plus respiratory or skin plus GI that I just previously talked about. But epinephrine is the first line and really only approved treatment for anaphylaxis. Um, there's been a lot of discussion here recently about the cost of epinephrine auto-injectors, whether it's the generic or the name brand. But to date, the most appropriate use and um, way to administer epinephrine for our patients is going to be an epinephrine auto-injector. Um, there's good studies that suggest using a vial and a syringe is just not, um, for the general public, not a good way to, a fast or efficient way to administer epinephrine. So when we look at how we diagnose anaphylaxis, and this is really where the emergency treatment part of this talks comes into play. There's a lot of different criteria that we use to, di uh, to diagnose anaphylaxis. Um, most of it is going to live in the center column there where we look for a likely exposure to a known allergen that an individual is sensitized to, and we're going to look for two system involvements. And I, again, I'm always going to suggest looking for skin plus coughing or wheezing, skin plus uh, vomiting or diarrhea. Um, if anybody carries around a blood pressure cuff, that's great. They can take their blood pressure. But again, most individuals, whether it's um, don't have a blood pressure cuff on hand, um, even in clinic, sometimes we are lucky to really get that blood pressure before anybody is really developing visible symptoms. Um, Criteria one, really, all you have to have is an acute onset of skin involvement and one of the following, either respiratory comp compromise, and that could be laryngeal edema, like throat tightening, um, wheezing, bronchospasm, like asthma-like symptoms, or again, if we're lucky enough to have that reduction in blood pressure, that's always nice. Um, and then lastly, that last criterion, or criterion three, that criterion three is where they have a known exposure, um, you're exposed to latex, this is probably going to be intraoperative uh, latex exposure, and you're going to drop in blood pressure. Um, however, it could be really any, any latex exposure, and you get a 30% 30, 30 decrease in your systolic blood pressure per normal. Um, and that's all you need to, to diagnose anaphylaxis. But for the sake of most individuals, most individuals are going to fit in that center column where we look for two, two system involvement. So why do we use epinephrine? Well, we use epinephrine for multiple reasons, but really the guidelines have really made a strong position that in the case of anaphylaxis, Anaphylaxis is really going to be treated. First line therapy is, is epinephrine. You can use other adjunctive medications after you administer epinephrine. But epinephrine, for most of our uh, guidelines and expert opinion papers, are going to be epi first, epi fast. And so epinephrine is what stops the allergic reaction or at least diminishes a lot of the effects. The reason we do IM epinephrine is for multiple reasons. One, it, compared to subcutaneous, it has a quicker onset of action. So we use epinephrine not only to compensate for symptoms that are 
uh, caused by anaphylaxis. So for comp do compensate compensation of what anaphylaxis is really causing, and that's going to be like a decrease in blood pressure um, and those shock-like symptoms. And so when you give IM epinephrine, you get a rapid rise in systolic and diastolic pressure um, to help um, incre reduce that shock-like picture we see with uh, anaphylaxis. And we also see a rise in heart rate, which is needed to compensate, again, for those shock-like symptoms we see with anaphylaxis. Um, epinephrine is very fast. Uh, it has a very quick onset, and we see those effects um, very rapidly, and they occur before 10 minutes. So why are patients reluctant to use epinephrine? Um, you know, there's been multiple studies looking at why do they not have an auto-injector, why do they not use it, and most of the time it's, it's a combination of multiple things, but one is they were diagnosed with, an, with a potentially life-threatening allergy, but maybe they weren't given a prescription by their physician or the ER. So if you don't have an auto-injector, you're not going to use it. Um, bullet point two has probably become a bigger issue. Um, we know that um, with rising cost in healthcare and rising cost of deductibles, um, a large percentage of the patients I see currently in my clinic that have commercial insurance, have high deductible plans. Um, I personally also have a high deductible plan, and so when you have a high, dedu a de high deductible plan, um, it's, you're probably going to be paying full cost for that medication. And currently, um, auto injectors are very expensive, whether it's generic or non-generic. Um, non they are very expensive. And so if that patient is on a, a very tight budget, which the majority of us in the U.S. are, and you go to fill that prescription and you can't afford it, you're going to have to weigh the cost versus the benefit of having that auto-injector. And the majority of those patients, we know, fill their auto-injector once, but they don't fill it a second time. And so currently, most auto-injectors are only good for about 18 months. That may change, but currently are good for about 18 months. And so once that prescription is filled, people Dr. Sublet, we're having, we're having a little trouble hearing you. If you have a phone, if it's on speaker, if you could just use the regular handset. We we're just having a little trouble hearing you. Thanks, Sally. So the bullet point three is where if you don't have it, you don't, you're not going to use it. And so if you're not carrying your auto injector, you're not going to use your auto, you're not going to use your epinephrine. Um, probably the thing that I see a lot with anaphylaxis is in, and the reason why people do not use epinephrine to treat their anaphylaxis is a lot of times anaphylaxis is self-limiting and mild. So even if you're exposed to your known allergen, some reactions are going to be resolved on their own. And this, I think, gives a lot of, um, uh, well, it can be very um, false sense of reassurance that okay, the next time I'm, I'm exposed, I'm not going to have a bad reaction. The problem with anaphylaxis is it's kind of like trying to predict tidal waves. Most tidal waves are going to be small, but we never know when the big one's going to hit. And unfortunately, that's true of anaphylaxis. A lot of, um, not necessarily in the latex data, but a lot of anaphylaxis deaths um, at least in food allergy, they all had mild reactions to begin with, but later on um, they had a severe reaction that led to death. So just know that just because you've had a mild reaction doesn't mean the next one is going to be mild. And that goes to bullet point number four there where, you know, the current reaction was very mild or improved very quickly. Um, we know that about 60% of people um, that 
have anaphylaxis use an antihistamine, which we'll talk about in a minute. But a lot of patients, because of anaphylaxis can be self-limiting, will use an antihistamine, things get better, and they'll think, okay, well, I use that Benadryl this time. I can use Benadryl the next time I have anaphylaxis, which unfortunately, again, is, um, is false reassurance. Um, people that use an auto injector are told they should be monitored in the ER. And because of high deductible plans, a lot of people do not want to go to the ER if they use their auto injector. And then this goes back to having a good action plan. But there are going to be times that patients are just unsure on when to eject or if they inject it too late. And this is where Epi first, epi fast is is always going to be important to teach our patients. Um, epinephrine is the first line and only approved treatment for anaphylaxis. And even if you give it inappropriately, it is a very safe medication. There is no current counterindication for using epinephrine. So why do we not use antihistamines in the treatment of anaphylaxis? And I think this is a slide that I like to show um, to really illustrate why we don't use antihistamines with anaphylaxis. If, if you look at the list of antihistamines, and they're listed in alphabetical order, but at the top is diphenhydramine, or also known as Benadryl, um, and it goes down the list. But most antihistamines have about a two-hour onset of action. So while, mo while all antihistamines have some instantaneous effect, our peak effect, our onset of action effect, really occurs about two hours. And so if you're thinking about anaphylaxis that is a rapid, potentially severe, life-threatening allergic reaction, if you're, waiting, if you're going to be waiting two hours for that drug to really take effect, it's going to be probably too late. This just illustrates that again, um, because, and that didn't really present well on your all screen, but I will kind of walk you through it. So this was a study that looked at um, histamine-induced flare and uh, time to 50% um, suppression, meaning when did they see a reduction in, uh, in, in flare to histamine. And the first one in the blue is fexofenity or allegra. And it took about 101 minutes before they, see to, they saw a 50% reduction in histamine flare. The second and third, the green is going to be diphenhydramine or Benadryl IM. And the third is going to be just oral diphenhydramine. And so if you look at both of those, they still took almost like in the case of um, intramuscular diphenhydramine, it took almost 51 minutes. Um, to see any 50% 50, 50 reduction in histamine flare. So again, anaphylaxis is very rapid. Um, and if, uh, as a provider, I don't want something that is going to be potentially very threatening and waiting around for diphenhydramine to work. Um, I would even contend that diphenhydramine in the treatment of uh, anaphylaxis, we should really think about not using it unless IV access is the only thing that we have. And the reason is, is because first generation um, antihistamines have sedating effects, uh, which may make it more complicated for us to really um, see some of the symptoms and communicate with our patients. So is the lightheadedness that a patient is experiencing, is it because of the diphenhydramine that they just received? Um, is the confusion they're having because of anaphylaxis or because of the diphenhydramine. So really Benadryl as a first generation antihistamine and the treatment of anaphylaxis really is not, we should be thinking about other potential, anaf um, other potential antihistamines to use after we give epinephrine. So what does the parameter say? What does the current anaphylaxis parameter suggest? Well, antihistamines and corticosteroids um, should, should only be used as adjunctive um, therapy. And the reason is multiple. The first is the pharmacodynamic activity 
of antihistamines or corticosteroids just take too long and they wouldn't prevent cardiorespiratory arrest or death. Um, and in the case of antihistamines, antihistamines really only antagonize the, hist the histamine effect. And there's other more important act, um, mediators that are released during anaphylaxis. Um, probably one of the most important is platelet activating factor, but there's other kinins that are associated with severe and potential fatal reactions that antihistamines just don't act on. And so in the parameter itself, it says never administer H1 or H2 antihistamines or corticosteroids as initial therapy for anaphylaxis. Instead, we should be using epinephrine and only consider these agents optional or adjunctive therapy. Personally, as an allergist, I do not use antihistamines as part of my anaphylaxis action plan for that for two reasons. One, I don't want to confuse my patients in the fact that if I put an antihistamine on their action plan, which one should I use? Should I use the epinephrine or should I use the antihistamine? And again, because anaphylaxis can be self-limiting, um, we don't know to date how to predict which ones are going to progress and which ones are going to self-limit. We, we should really default back to using epinephrine, which is a very safe and effective treatment for anaphylaxis. So the current ER guidelines really mirror the, the uh, guidelines that we have in allergy. And so this is the current ER guidelines um, that um, most ER should follow. And so if you look, if anaphylaxis is likely, there's three criteria. One is on the far right, criterion three, if they're exposed to known allergen, do they have a drop in that um, in, in blood pressure? Do they have that 30% drop in normal blood pressure? Um, column two, again, mirrors our current guidelines in the sense that do they have multi-system involvement following a potential exposure, um, or do they have an onset of an, uh, and criteria one is where they have an acute onset of illness that really looks like anaphylaxis, do they have skin involvement, hives, flushing, generalized itching, angioedema with either that drop in blood pressure or rep respiratory compromise. So the ER physicians and the allergists are really on the same page. And current guidelines suggest for ER physician care, um, you know, IM epinephrine is the treatment of choice. Um, if they do treat for anaphylaxis, they should give their patients an educational instruction sheet at time of discharge. Uh, they should prescribe a epinephrine auto injector at time of discharge. Again, if you are treating for a potentially severe allergic reaction or anaphylaxis, regardless, they should receive an epinephrine auto injector to go home with before um, that time period between the ER visit and seeing a specialist. And the current guidelines for ER physicians is refer them to a specialist. Yes, once you've had that episode of anaphylaxis, we need for those people to be seen by a specialist to confirm that diagnosis and then reinforce the use of epinephrine for the treatment of anaphylaxis. So something that uh, interesting is, um, you know, do the ER physicians really they have their guidelines. Do they practice what they preach? Um, and uh, Dr. Russell, who is currently um, presenting the anaphylaxis summits um, across the U.S., uh, he in Charleston actually has some really good data uh, to suggest maybe we can do better in the ER setting. Um, so in his study, they actually identified 124 patients with clinical diagnosed anaphylaxis. Of those patients, only about 54% of them received epinephrine, and a large majority of those patients, though, received antihistamines and corticosteroids. 
So again, if we're talking about appropriate treatment of anaphylaxis, um, can we do better in the ER setting? And the answer is absolutely. We know that epi first, epi fast is the current guideline of what we should be treating um, anaphylaxis with. We also think that if we show that epinephrine works for our patients in a situation of anaphylaxis, they are more likely to use epinephrine if they experience anaphylaxis. So again, administering epinephrine um, can improve in an ER setting. What does this mean for my patients? Well, it means that really they need to be self-advocates as well. If they are experiencing anaphylaxis and either have used their auto-injector but are having a reoccurrence of symptoms in the ER, I'm always going to tell my patients that if you feel like you're, you're not receiving epinephrine because they're not recognizing it, ask them or tell them, I think I need more epinephrine. Um, it's gonna, it's, you have to be a little bit of a self-advocate for, um, for yourself if in the cases of anaphylaxis, because if anything, this study illustrates that we still rely heavily on antihistamine therapy and corticosteroid therapy to treat these of reactions when really we should be thinking about giving epinephrine. The other reason epinephrine is going to be important in the setting of an ER is we know that most this progression of anaphylaxis occurs because of a delay in epinephrine. And there's been studies that demonstrate that biphasic reactions are a reoccurrence of anaphylaxis after that initial onset of symptoms is you, could be related to a delay in epinephrine. And ep, that anaphylaxis fatalities has also been directly associated with delay in epinephrine. So to give time for questions tonight and to, because um, really the, the, the guidelines clearly state up you first, up you fast. I'm going to kind of end with summary slides and open it up to questions. But just in summary for tonight, you know, what I would recommend um, and what the guidelines would recommend is if you think you have a latex allergy, or, and you've had a reaction that is consistent with um, even mild anaphylaxis, you want to get evaluated by a board-certified allergist to really walk through the history of your reaction and also undergo diagnostic testing to help confirm that latex allergy. And once you have developed, um, once you've been diagnosed with latex allergy, you really need to implement latex avoidance measures. And while at home that may be easy, it's really about implementing those latex avoidance measures in the public. So, you know, being aware that latex balloons still are potentially a major problem for our latex allergic patients. Um, you know, telling a restaurant when, I, you, when an individual goes out to eat, I'm a latex allergic patient, do not use latex gloves, do you, and ask the question, do you use latex gloves in your kitchen? Um, we know that cross-contamination can occur, so again, you want to make the chef and the restaurant aware. Um, anybody that is latex allergic needs to have an anaphylaxis action plan. If you're exposed, this is what you need to do, and it's epinephrine. So an epinephrine auto-injector needs to be used if you know you've been exposed to latex and you develop one system involvement of either hives, flushing, generalized itching, um, or respiratory coughing or wheezing, or abdominal cramping, vomiting and diarrhea. If you're unsure, then you're going to look for those two system involvements, and that's where the action plan, the asthma action plan, can really help a patient guide the use of epinephrine in their epinephrine auto-injector. And really in the clinic, in the ER, or for our patients that have been exposed, it's always going to be epinephrine first and epinephrine fast. The data suggests that really antihistamines, corticosteroids should not be used as first-line therapy 
for anaphylaxis, it's epinephrine first, not only because of the compensatory mechanisms that epinephrine provides our patients, but also really it, it working at the cellular level to really stop the release of mediators um, when anaphylaxis is occurring. And so I think, Sally, we're probably about at the 40-minute mark um, or around that point. And I'd really like to open up the questions because really this is a broad subject, um, not only about you know anaphylaxis, but also just about latex allergy. And I know that one of our presenters later in the month is going to talk a lot about latex. Um, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that may um, be in our audience tonight. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sublett. You know, one thing I just think I want everyone to take away from this is epinephrine first, epinephrine fast. So I'm thrilled that that's something that you have stressed this evening. But we do have some questions. One of them is, there are many fruits that are cross-reactive with a latex allergy for a latex allergy patient. The question is, am I to avoid them all if I have the allergy or just if I react to them? Sally? Did you hear the question? So, I'm sorry. For some reason, <laughs> there's okay. the technology here at the end. So, uh, so, the so I'll, I'll rephrase the question. There are a lot of fruits that are cross-reactive for the latex allergic patient. Well, the question is, if I have the allergy, should I avoid all of them or only if I react to them? You know, that is a great question. Um, you know, I think that if you've had if you've had um, reactions to those um, fruits before, um, I, you know, I think that definitely you should um, you should avoid. It's it's really unclear. Um, you know, the safest bet is yes, you should avoid those those fruits, um, but. If you've tolerated, if you've eaten those fruits without incidence of any symptoms, and you do have true latex allergy, then I would say that it's it's okay for you to continue to eat those um, those fruits because this is where the cross reactivity between the fruits and the latex is really unclear. Some people will have no issues when they eat those fruits. Whereas other people will have problems, and so uh, it's it's something that you have to proceed with caution. And I know that's that's more of a generic answer, but if you're eating the fruit currently in your latex allergy, then you should continue to eat that fruit. However, if you've had symptoms with those fruits and you're latex allergic, then you should not continue. Uh, to ingest those fruits. Does that does, does that answer the question? I think that does. Someone is also asking for the reference for the antihistamine pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics slide. I don't know if you can uh, circle back to that slide. Uh, it was the one with the um, antihistamines in the chart. And if maybe we can uh, let the person then move their screen up just a little bit to check out the reference. Otherwise, uh, if, if you would like to email me later, we can go ahead and get that reference for you. Are, are you able to head back to it? There we go. So uh, it's at the bottom of the slide. So sometimes you just have to move it up in your, your window and you'll get a chance to see that. So we'll just leave that so there. The reference yeah, so the reference there is actually from Middleton's, which is one of our major allergy textbooks. Um, I could also point that individual to really the, the uh, pharmacodynamic studies that have been done um, with um, the individual uh, antihistamines if they so wanted. I could do that off air. Um, but just know the pharmacodynamic studies have really been well characterized. Um, and um, probably the one that I would contend is probably not the best pharmacodynamic study was the one with desloratadine. Um, because it is the active metabolite of loratadine, we think that um, on this particular slide it has a Tmax of one to three, and that's what's been reported. 
But I will say that because it is the active metabolite of loratadine, um, so does loratadine is Clarinex, loratadine is Claritin. We think that it probably it's it's a little bit quicker than loratadine, probably closer to an hour. Okay, thank you. And we'll just leave that slide up there so someone can see the, the reference. Another question. As a school nurse, I have a hard time convincing parents and staff to use EpiPens as first-line treatment and not waiting for the student to develop very severe signs and symptoms. Do you have any advice? Um, great question. Um, and great topic because, uh, you know, um, a lot of individuals are scared of not only what they're allergic to, but giving themselves an injection to treat their anaphylaxis. Um, and so I think you really have to do one of, do two things. One is refer them back to their specialist to really reinforce that idea of, of if you have a reaction, you need to use epinephrine, um, ideally in the, in the form of an epinephrine auto-injector. And I secondly, okay. oh, well, and secondly, really um, to, um, to really tell those parents that, um, you know, epinephrine is the only approved therapy for anaphylaxis. And so if your child is having a reaction, we don't wait for it to become severe to stop it. Matter of fact, we know delay can result in death. And I know that sounds like a mean way of saying it, but really we want an early treatment to stop that allergic reaction um, uh, as quick as we can. Um, sometimes I use an analogy of a house fire. You wouldn't wait until... Um, your house was halfway on fire to use your fire extinguisher. You would want to put the fire out as quick as possible. And so, you know, up you first, up you fast is the motto we should be, we use, we should use. I love that analogy. I, I had an allergist. I was a school nurse for many years, and I had an allergist who once told me that if you say to yourself, gee, I wonder if I should use the and epinephrine was the next word. You should just go ahead and give it and not even finish the sentence. So here's the next question. I have heard keeping a food diary is helpful in pinpointing a possible cross-reactive allergy. Do you also recommend this? Well, I think cross-reactivity, that it, it, it's a food allergy today, um, it sometimes as clear as mud, <laughs> um, and I say that, and I say that in all reality because really, the, I would tell you that the most um, clinical, meaningful food allergy history is one where you eat a specific food and you develop clinical symptoms, and usually it's multi-system symptoms. So what what that means is you get not only skin involvement, but usually respiratory or skin involvement plus GI. Cross-reaction, cross-reactivity to foods, and this isn't really tonight about a food talk, but cross-reactivity to foods is known, um, and it's probably because of similar shared proteins. Um, and so clinical history is important, and, and one way of identifying those cross-reactive foods is going to be doing a food diary. Clinical diagnosis, though, really with the food diary plus diagnostic challenge or diagnostic testing plus potentially a food challenge, really is the current uh, the current uh, recommendation because the gold standard in food allergy um, is a failed oral food challenge. That doesn't mean that I do an oral food challenge in all my patients if the clinical history is good um, and very convincing and um, the, uh, the diagnostic testing confirms that. But if, it's, uh, if food allergy is a mystery, really that's when you want to think about potentially doing that oral food challenge to confirm. 
Okay, thank you. Last question. Uh, there's so so little seems to be so little awareness and attention to latex allergy. Are there any efforts to train primary care and emergency room providers on latex allergy? Well, um, that is a great question. So you know there are efforts um, on the um, through the. Um, the uh, latex uh, network and also through um, the allergy and asthma network to really make um, both the food industry and healthcare workers aware of latex allergy. Um, I think one reason that the efforts have not um, really grown is because we've seen um, a decrease in the incidence of latex allergy in the sense that because healthcare workers which were the um, probably the number one population behind spina bifida patients. Um, we're, we're just not exposed to the natural rubber latex gloves as much as we were, and because of the incidence of latex allergy has gone down. And with that, the awareness efforts go down. But you know the. Um, the Allergy and Asthma Network um, and uh, the Latex Network have really done a great job of, um, Sue's done a great job of continuing to really reach out to providers and educate them about, um, about latex and latex anaphylaxis. Well, Dr. Sublett, we certainly just want to thank you for everything this evening uh, from the Allergy and Asthma Network as well as the American Latex Allergy Association. We're so pleased you could be with us. I'd like to uh, tell our listeners that we're going to have an additional webinar in October as we mark Latex Allergy Awareness Week. Our second webinar will look at overcoming barriers in the real world and address clinical issues school concerns, and living with latex allergy. This will be presented at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on October 20th with Dr. Sandra Gotchik and Patricia Beyer Waltus as our guests. Register on our website at www.allergyasthmanetwork.org. Click on Education and then Webinars to register. And you'll also find all of our webinars have been recorded there, and this one will appear there as well. Our webinar series helps the Allergy and Asthma Network to live out our mission to end the ne needless death and suffering due to asthma, allergies, and related conditions through outreach, education, advocacy, and research. So again, as before we part ways today, please access our website for valuable information with sections designed specifically for patients as well as healthcare providers. We will be posting this webinar, but please check all of the webinars that we've previously had in our series. Uh, look for education, pay the page, and then webinars on our website. This is Sally Schessler, Director of Education, and on behalf of the Allergy and Asthma Network, thank you for joining us today. <music>